Hi, I'm Mei Qin, a fourth year graduate student from the Yale Social Robotics Lab. Today, I'm going to present an exciting study on animal robot interactions. We collaborated with the Canine Cognition Center at Yale to study whether domestic dogs would follow sick commands from a social robot. HRI studies the social interactions between humans and robots. Practically, it can also help with designing the industrial products. Studying animal robot interactions can help to study the social interactions from an evolutionary approach. The evolutionary approach is used by comparative psychologists. They compare behaviors or cognition functions of interest across different species. The comparison results can help the researchers to understand how the behaviors or the cognition functions developed phylogenetically and thus help them to understand human better. Similarly, studying animal robot interactions can help to answer theoretical questions in HRI. Practically, studying animal robot interactions can also help to design the industrial products to be pet friendly so that the robots at home doesn't scare the dogs. In this study, we choose to study dogs for two reasons. First, dogs are one of the most common type of pets at home and working animals. Second, they excel in understanding human social behaviors even better than non-human primates, such as chimpanzees and gorillas. In the previous study, the cuddles at all studied whether dogs would follow the pointing gesture given by a people bot. The dog should choose the bucket being pointed at to get the treat. They included two conditions, the asocial condition and the social condition. As the name implied, in the asocial condition, the robot behaved mechanically. And in the social condition, the robot behaved in a social manner. If chosen randomly, the dog will only be able to get the treat 50% of the time. If follow the pointing gesture, the performance should be significantly above chance level, which is 50%. Their results showed that, although the dog's performance was significantly better in the social condition than in the asocial condition, the dog's performance was at chance level in both conditions. This indicated that the dogs did not follow the pointing gestures. In our study, we aimed at understanding would dogs respond to a social robot behaviorally at all or not? To explore this, we included two experiments. In experiment one, we tested whether dogs respond to a robot calling its name, like Fido. In experiment two, we tested whether dogs will follow the sit commands given by a robot, like Fido, sit. We conducted a between participants study with two conditions. In the testing condition, we use a robot. In the control condition, we use a loudspeaker. In both conditions, we used pre-recorded audio clips with human voice rather than text-to-speech module to make it easier for the dog to interpret. We included 34 pet dogs with various breed, age, and gender, 17 dogs in each condition. We have tested 42 dogs in total. Eight dogs were excluded due to dogs failing inclusion criteria technical problems, and human ears. This exclusion rate is typical in dog studies. Here's the procedure. The study started with a brief introduction between the dog, the dog's guardian, and the robot. The brief introduction was followed by experiment one, the robot calling the dog's name. Here are a few examples. Asher, Katie. Afterwards, it's a 10 minutes conversation between the guardian and the robot to ensure the dog have enough time to get used to the novel stimuli, the robot or the loudspeaker. Following the conversation with the warm-up session. The warm-up session is a typical design in dog studies. It generally serves for three purposes. First, it's used as an exclusion criteria. Second, it's used to excite the dog. Third, it's used to train the guardians as the handlers in the experiment. In our study, we included two tasks. First, the robot providing treats to a dog. This serves for all three purposes. 
Second, the guardians gave basic commands. This is mainly used as an exclusion criteria to ensure the dog understands the verbal command, sit. In the testing condition, the robot drop the treat on the white plate and give the release command so that the dog can approach the treat. In the control condition, a human experimenter will put the treat on the white plate. The dogs were only able to get the treat after the loudspeaker gave the release command. In the end, we ran experiment two, the robot giving the sit commands. And here are a few examples. Red, sit. <laughs> I would like to point out a major difference between the two conditions. In the testing condition, we provided a treat after the dog followed the sit commands given by a robot, but not in a loudspeaker's condition. We acknowledge this is a limitation of the study, and here's why we made the design. First, when providing a treat, the experimenter should not be in the loop. Otherwise, the dog may interpret the treat being controlled by the experimenter, and thus follow the sick commands due to human authority. Second, in resident study, even trained dog did not follow the commands given by a loud speaker at a professional dog training facility with professional dog trainers. In our study, our dogs are pet dogs and we're not professional dog trainers, therefore, we do not expect our dogs to outperform the dogs in resident study. Third, we have attempted other methods as well, such as including an automatic dispenser. However, it takes too long for the dog to associate verbal commands with the dispenser. To ensure an ethical study, our testing protocol requires to stop testing whenever the dog shows reluctance to continue. Therefore, we came up with the current design to be used as a baseline condition. Here are the results for experiment one. We have 34 dogs in total, 17 in each condition. The yellow bar showed the number of dogs look at the target before the names were called. The blue bar showed the number of dogs look at the target after the name were called. In the robot condition, there are significantly more dogs looking at the robot after the names were being called. In the loudspeaker condition, there's no such trend. In experiment two, the robot given sit commands we use the obedience scores to evaluate the dog's performances. The obedience score is the number of the dog's sit over the total number of the sit commands given. For example, if the dogs were given four sit commands and they sit two times, then the obedience score is 0.5. So the obedience score is a number between zero and one. The higher it is, the more often that the dog follow the sit commands. Here are the results of experiment two. Again, there are 34 participants, 17 in each condition. In the robot condition, the average obedience score is 65%, indicating the dogs follow the robot commands 65% of the time. In the loudspeaker condition, the dogs only follow the command 13% of the time. And there are significant differences between the two conditions. Our results show that the dogs follow the social commands given by the robot. We think there are three potential reasons. First, the dog may perceive the robot as an agent and thus follow its commands. Second, it may be because of embodiment. The robot is physically in the room, but the agent given the command by the last speaker is not in the room. Third, it may be because of the multimodal cues. The robot provided both the visual and the audio cues while the loudspeaker only provided the audio cues. In the end, I would like to thank all of our collaborators to help us run the study and code the videos. I would also like to thank all of our doc participants and their guardians for their supports. I would also like to thank our funding agencies, National Science Foundation, and the Office of Naval Research. If you have any questions regarding this study, please feel free to email me. For more studies, please visit my website at www.maintian.com or just simply scan the QR code to reach my website. Thanks for joining me.